Good. All right, everybody, welcome. We are gonna just take a couple minutes here to let everyone uh, sign on. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you all for joining us. And I'll start at a uh, couple minutes after the hour here, just let people kind of sign on, get settled in. Everybody see me okay? Just one more minute here. We'll uh, we'll get moving on this. Thank you all for joining us. All righty, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Forward Food Collaborative webinar for, uh, for this quarter. Um, we are really excited to be here today with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, and I really can't wait for you all to see the awesome uh, presentation that they have put together for you. Uh, just a couple things really quickly. My name is Nathan Alexander. I am a food service innovation coordinator with the Humane Society of the United States. Um, you will be hearing today from Stephanie Feldstein from the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, she is the Population and Sustainability Director. And you will also be hearing from uh, Jennifer Molidor, who is a senior food campaigner with Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, my colleague Amanda Trenchard is going to be helping with the Q&A at the end of the webinar, so don't forget um, to jot down questions, enter them into the Q&A button um, that should be at the bottom of your screen. And also, uh, please don't forget to follow us on social media. We would love to hear from you. Um, share about this webinar, share about your plant-based efforts, um, menu items, events, and uh, don't forget to tag us at uh, hashtag forward food. So all of our um, social media information is right here, and it'll also be available at the end of the webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping details. This is a one hour long webinar. And again, we are recording it. So this will be available um, to share um, and it'll also be available on our website. Uh, I'm gonna quickly touch on why food is changing and then I'm gonna turn it over to Center for Biological Diversity um, to talk about um, what they're gonna do today, catering to the climate, menus for a healthy planet. And then we will open it up uh, at the end for a Q&A. Um, there's also going to be a short survey that we'll be sending out after the webinar. Uh, it would be a huge help if you could fill that out. It really drives the, the direction we're able to take these in the future. We love your feedback, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, yeah, so let's dive in. I'm just going to kind of do a, a brief overview and then I'm going to let CBD dry, uh, dive in for a much more in depth perspective. So um, I really first want to just touch on why food is changing. So I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with the work that we do at the Humane Society of the United States with dining programs, universities, K-12s, uh, hospitals, and some of the largest food service management companies uh, in the country to increase the amount of plant-based uh, options that are being consistently featured, consistently served on menus. We have an incredible team of dietitians, uh, chefs, food and nutrition specialists that work uh, with these programs in a variety of ways. And the bulk of this work that we do is through culinary education. So uh, in just five years, we've hosted over 530 culinary events. We've trained over 11,000 chefs, food service professionals, uh, and medical professionals. And we've worked directly with over 630 programs to implement plant-based initiatives. Uh, and at our last metric, I believe, uh, this has led to an average of about 12% of food service menus already being plant-based. So we're just really excited about uh, you know, the success that we've seen 
through the work that you all have done at, at your institutions. Um, but also you still might be wondering what's actually driving this shift. And the answer is a lot of things. Um, customers, students, patients, institutions are all increasingly interested in health, the environment, animal welfare, uh, alternative proteins, cost savings, food safety, the list goes on. Public health is a big one. Um, and, and so these are all things that are driving exactly why food is changing. And uh, Center for Biological Diversity is gonna dive into that a little bit more. Um, but first, I, I really just wanna touch on, um, to lend a little bit more credibility to what I'm talking about here, uh, because I can tell you all day that, that you know, this plant-based movement is growing, but um, don't just take it from me. There are so many publications that have uh, shed light on this, including Food Service Director, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, they predicted that for 2020, plant-based options are going to become more mainstream than ever. And guess what? They were right. And that trend has continued through 2021. Um, no matter how you look at it, it's just clear that the plant-based food sector is uh, growing rapidly. And um, COVID is something that really accelerated this. So uh, during a, a, in a survey put out by the International Food Information Council, they found that a quarter of respondents are eating more plant-based protein um, since the outbreak hit. And um, while this is pretty incredible, and, and by the way, millennials and Gen Z uh, are a huge part of that, and um, which I know they're a big chunk of who you all serve. Um, one thing I really wanna emphasize is that uh, even though COVID is a major accelerator, this movement has been rapidly accelerating pre-COVID and I guarantee you it will continue to do so once COVID is long gone. Um, so with that, I really wanna turn things over to Center for Biological Diversity and um, we are gonna get to hear an awesome talk from them. So um, take it away. Thank you guys. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're really excited to be here with you all today. As Nathan mentioned, we are here from the Center for Biological Diversity, which is a national nonprofit wildlife conservation organization. So we're dedicated to protecting wildlife and the wild places that they need to thrive. And when we look at that, it's not only all of the work that we do for things like Endangered Species Act protections, but also looking at what are the underlying causes of what is really threatening life on this planet. And when we look at that, one of the major factors is, of course, climate change and the connection of uh, food systems to uh, not just the climate crisis, but also to other factors to the extinction crisis, like habitat loss and all of that. But today we're going to focus on the climate because there's no question that we need to rapidly transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy to stop climate change, but the climate crisis is such a massive all hands on deck issue that changing the energy system alone won't be enough. Several studies have shown that even if the energy system went carbon neutral tomorrow, we still wouldn't be able to meet international climate targets without reducing meat and dairy consumption and production. So what we eat and produce is a really important part of this picture. And Jennifer is going to talk a bit more about how meat and dairy fit into the, the climate issue. And then we'll talk about the role of institutional food service in reducing food related emissions and the steps that you all can take toward climate friendly menus. And with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm really happy to be here speaking with you today. So animal agriculture is responsible for 16.5% of global greenhouse gases. In the US, cattle emit more than a third of the methane emissions, which is a greenhouse gas that's 86 times more potent than carbon over a 20 year period. Um, and these are conservative estimates actually. But it's not just methane. Land use conversion for animal agriculture leads to a loss of natural carbon sinks in forests and grasslands, um, which destroys or damages ecosystems we need to survive. So not just wildlife, um, but human um, communities as well. Other impacts include climate-driven wildfires, which you may be all too familiar with if you live on the West Coast like me, but um, also deforestation through fire. So clearing pastures to graze sheep and cattle, for example, which has an enormous impact on the climate. Something's also close to home for me on the West Coast um, is extreme drought and 
figuring out a way to build a food system that avoids food production that uses a lot of water. And meat production tops the charts in water use and water pollution also as well, um, especially red meat. So especially beef, for example, and also lamb. Nearly half of the water used in the US goes towards meat and dairy. And that just doesn't seem like a smart food system, right? So nearly a quarter of the water that we use goes to irrigate feed crops for cows to produce beef um, and dairy. And so that, again, that also doesn't seem like an effective food system that we wanna support with our menus and institutional policies. Another thing that people don't talk about quite as much because it's uncomfortable, it's a little bit unpleasant, is slaughterhouses, right? So slaughterhouses are an enormous source of waste, of pollution, of myriad climate damages and environmental damages. Um, in fact, they're the largest point source for water pollution in the United States. Toxic substances, tens of millions of pounds of them are poured directly into rivers and streams which makes human communities sick as well as wildlife and ecosystems. And the laws surrounding these factories are shockingly weak and very rarely enforced. So that's not something we wanna support as well. And the way that we're growing food is a threat to almost 30,000 species of wild plants and animals that are imperiled already. Scientists predict that more than a third of wildlife will be extinct by 2050 probably sooner if current emissions continue. And this is gonna be a catastrophic loss for biodiversity, for ecosystems, for human societies around the world, from the air that we breathe to having clean water and so on. Meat production is a major contributor to rising temperatures um, that are reducing food sources, causing drought, rising sea levels, and impacting nearly 20% of federally protected species. The recent West Coast heat wave killed nearly 1 billion sea creatures. Um, just a shocking amount. And sorry, I keep bringing it back to the West Coast for those of you who are not on the West Coast, but this is just a, an evidence of something for, for us that's impacting this big agricultural system that we have here, and it's just an example so far. Um, now, a trend is sort of, uh, responding to this information about the disastrous impact of, of our food systems on the climate. And one of these trends is climate-friendly meat. So let's look into that a little bit. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about this too. I think a lot of people have questions about this, about menus, about is this a good solution? We're seeing trends of calling climate-damaging foods climate-friendly, right? So is there such thing as climate-friendly meat? Beef is the most impactful food for greenhouse gases, period. Um, it's also at the top of the charts for land use, for water use, for water pollution. Americans also eat far more of it than is good for their health. And they also eat four times the global average. So we're eating a lot of beef. It's enormously impactful on the climate. And yet industry marketing is pushing this as sort of part of the American identity and sense of self, right? You know, don't tread on our beef or our cattle and our way of life. But to address these climate impacts and health impacts and so forth, beef producers are looking into ways that they can make beef more palatable for the American public. And given all this data that's coming out um, about climate and water use. So they're doing things like feed additives, feeding cows different things, talking about grazing different ways. But there's many studies on this. Overwhelming evidence shows that these efforts, while good and appreciated, fall short of any real change that we need to make this big improvement. Wildlife is still harmed, waterways are still polluted. When they are successful at sequestering carbon in the short term, they're gonna emit more methane by having more cattle um, grazing the landscape. So it also only works in certain regions. The dry landscapes of the West are not good for water guzzling cows, for example. And studies show that even if we could switch to an all grass fed system, this climate friendly beef, uh, we can only support 27% of current consumption. And so that tells us again, we drastically need to reduce beef from our menus. Um, and so that's why we need institutions to help shift us away towards climate friendly menus that are really climate friendly. Um, Stephanie's gonna talk about why institutions are an important part of that change. 
Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so it's uh, it's clear from all this, you know, like we said up front, that we can't just change how we produce food. We can't just make these like small tweaks around the edges of the problem, but we need to really change what we grow and eat. And institutional food service is a huge opportunity to help create that change, which to me is really exciting because obviously when we run through all of the horrible things that are happening to the planet right now, solutions are so important and we all can be a part of that. So as I mentioned up front, several studies have shown the importance of shifting diets when it comes to stopping the climate crisis. And one study from the University of Michigan looked at the climate impact of different diet scenarios in the United States and how they could contribute to meeting emissions reduction goals by 2030. Um, 2030 is the year when uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the kind of world body of scientists who are really deeply studying the climate crisis and, and how to stop it, they have said that if we don't slash emissions by nearly 50% by 2030, then we won't be able to avoid catastrophic climate change. So that's a really important date to keep in mind that also speaks to the urgency of making these changes. And this study from the University of Michigan looked at um, the scenario of if we replaced half of all animal products with plant-based foods, then it would reduce diet-related emissions by 35%. And if we further replace beef by 90%, because as Jennifer mentioned, beef has this disproportionate impact on the climate, as well as other aspects of environmental damage. So if we replace 90% of beef alongside 50% of all other animal products, then that would drop diet-related emissions by 51%. And by 2030, that 90%, 50% reduction would save 2.4 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So that would be a huge contribution towards, um, towards our climate goals. But if we continue on the path of current eating trends and the um, meat and dairy heavy diet in the United States, then emissions would actually rise by 9% by 2030. So that would be taking us obviously further from our climate goals. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how change happens because people often think of dietary change as an individual choice and our choices do matter, especially with food. I mean, when we logged on to this webinar this morning, we didn't have much choice about where our energy came from, but every time we sit down to eat, we do get to choose what we put on our plates. And that in turn helps create demand that changes what foods are offered. And then that moves up the chain to what's grown and that can influence market costs, can influence you know, what policymakers are looking at and what kinds of foods and agricultural practices to support. So it all has, is all part of this system um, of change that happens when it comes to, to food and agriculture. But there are also limitations to individual choice. And this is an important part that's often left out of the conversation because our choices are limited by availability, affordability, and accessibility. And what I mean by accessibility are things like the ability to get to supermarkets, whether there are familiar foods on menus, whether people have the time and the knowledge to cook healthier foods um, and foods that they may not have tried before because it's a lot easier to choose to change your diet if you have five grocery stores near your home and extra time on your hands, than if say the only option for food within five miles of where you live is a convenience store and you're working multiple jobs and you don't have a lot of time for shopping and cooking and traveling to get food and all of that. So it's really important to note that choice is limited by inequality. But those limitations are largely determined by a complex web of policies at the local, state, and federal level, as well as institutional policies. And so the good news here is we can change those policies in ways that can make healthy, sustainable options more accessible and equitable for everybody. Um, so policy change can take a lot of forms, and this is obviously not a comprehensive list, just a few examples that um, I wanted to, to briefly touch on here. Um, so policy interventions can be things like looking at the dietary guidelines for Americans, which I don't think anybody thinks about the dietary guidelines when they sit down to eat in a conscious way, but the dietary guidelines have a huge influence over you know, menus in schools, in military institutions, prisons, hospitals, and government cafeterias. So there's a huge, um, impact on the market there, but also on what foods are put in front of people from, you know, children to senior citizens relying on meals on wheels. So across a lot of pro programs, the dietary guidelines have a very direct influence. 
but they also influence the way that we think about food and nutrition education. So for example, if we were to integrate um, sustainability into dietary guidelines and align those guidelines with climate policy, then we would begin to see a shift in how people think about what's on their plate and what foods are actually available to people and considered part of a diet that's healthy for people and the planet. Um, in school food, there's a whole suite of policies, um, you know, which some of you may be dealing with every day that influence what's available in school food. Um, and really changing those again to align with making healthier, more sustainable foods available can be very important. Uh, we're looking for climate action plans to recognize that food policy is climate policy. And again, that can hold uh, cities and institutions accountable for the emissions associated with their food purchases and what's on their menus, but it also can help open the door for resources in creative ways from you know, public education on sustainable eating to you know, community gardens that help increase food sovereignty and access to um, very fresh and very local produce. Um, policies that um, can make plant-based options more widely available, things like Meatless Mondays are really common, and we're also seeing some cities start to look at policies requiring plant-based options to be um, always available at like city venues and entertainment venues and that sort of thing. And having those meat-free meals on the menu can really help not only make it easier for people to choose them, but to normalize the idea of eating meat-free meals. And finally, um, companies and institutions can also make their own commitments to purchasing less meat and dairy and increasing plant-based options on their menus. So let's talk a little bit about what these climate-friendly menus actually look like. So we've come a really long way from the plant-based option being an iceberg salad and a side of fries. I mean, the possibilities are really endless, whether you're doing quick service or gourmet dining. And climate-friendly menus are plant-centered. And so these can be dishes that are entirely free from any kind of meat, fish, eggs, or dairy. They can be vegetarian options that may have a little bit of eggs or dairy in there. Or they can be dishes where meat is used more as a flavoring than a centerpiece. So there are a lot of different things that this can look like and a lot of ways that it can fit whatever is, is right for the type of food service that you're doing and the type of clientele that you're serving. So we've seen a lot of institutions offering plant-based meats as a familiar item that's easy to add to the menu. Um, and there are really significant advantages to plant-based meat compared to beef burgers. I mean, there are enormous environmental savings really across the board, whether you're talking about land, water, the greenhouse gas emissions, and the, the energy requirements to produce them. Um, they just require so many fewer resources that they, they are a better option from, from the climate and environmental point of view, for sure. And I know obviously there are no animals involved. So if that is your, you know, is that if that is part of your concerns as well, obviously there's a huge advantage there as well. And there are other benefits too, like there are no zoonotic disease risks associated with plant-based meat because by definition, zoonotic diseases come from animals. Um, the working conditions to produce these meats are far safer than they are. Um, meat packing and slaughterhouse jobs are among the most dangerous jobs um, in, in the country. And there have been no links to foodborne illnesses or serious disease risks, such as the things we see with high um, red meat and processed meat consumption in particular, around like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, and that sort of thing. So there are a lot of benefits to plant-based meats, and these products are popular um, and kind of an easy swap on menus, but climate-friendly menus can be so much more than plant-based meats too. So these products may be good for you, but some people also want foods that are healthier and less processed than, than burgers. So these are an option, but they're far from the only one. And I know the Humane Society has a ton of resources to help you create climate-friendly menus that are a good fit for your institution. And the Center for Biological Diversity also released a report called Catering to the Climate that compares the environmental impact of other types of popular catering items, such as burritos, sandwiches, lasagna, and um, other breakfast, lunch, or dinner options. So there's really a wide array at any time of day in every meal. And you can really start making these menu changes with any meal. And people often leap to their featured menu items, but there really are opportunities across food service to begin serving more climate-friendly options. And that includes beverages. 
And I wanted to talk about um, dairy for a minute because dairy comes from those same environmentally damaging cows that Jennifer was talking about earlier. So it comes with a hefty environmental cost. And I know a lot of times we see um, articles that, you know, almonds are a really thirsty crop. So, you know, so there are some concerns about the impact of almond milk on the environment. And compared to other plant-based milks, um, almonds do require more water. And a lot of them are grown in drought-stricken regions like California, but it's still far less water use than dairy. And, you know, dairy cattle are also present in many of those same, same regions um, where, where the agricultural use of water is really damaging and exacerbating these droughts. So different plant milks come with different environmental footprints. So if you are concerned about the water footprint of you know, something like almond milk or rice milk, there are other options like soy and oat milk and others that aren't on this chart like hemp milk that are you know, increasingly available. If you are concerned about um, you know, potential allergies or other concerns that people may have around soy, again, like there's just a lot, a lot to choose from and they've really become more mainstream. But across the board, all of these different plant milks, they all outperform dairy from the environmental perspective. And, you know, and this and dairy is something to, cons to, to consider because there are a lot of ways to integrate this into your menus. For example, some institutions have had success with removing dairy as the default at coffee kiosks so that people, instead of just automatically getting dairy in their coffee drinks, they have to choose what kind of milk that they want. And that makes it a lot easier for people to try alternatives because this dairy sector is an area where we see a lot of people, um, you know, you look at the market data, buying both alternative milks and dairy. Like people are, are very plant-based milk curious and they wanna try the different milks and people also, you know, sometimes have different uses. Like they really like oat milk in their coffee, even though they might have other uses for dairy milk. So making those changes where you're making it easier for people to make these choices means they're more likely to do so. And doing this also helps make your menus more inclusive. We know that lactose intolerance is very common, particularly in Black and Asian communities, but people also have different medical, health, ethical, and religious concerns about a variety of animal products. So integrating more plant-centered options into your menu can also be a way to better serve your institution's diverse community. So what would a roadmap look like to achieve some of these changes. Um, you know, I've talked a little bit about the, the individual changes that you can make to swap out ingredients and to try new dishes and to rethink what's on your menu. And I know that Nathan will talk a little bit more about that because again, the Humane Society has great resources to help you make that happen. But we also wanted to leave you with a roadmap about how to kind of successfully implement these changes and also to more, you know, holistically approach uh, you know, improving the climate footprint of your food service. So the first step is make sure that whatever you're doing is appealing to your audience. A climate friendly menu won't matter if people don't want to eat it. So what works for one institution may not work for yours. Design those climate friendly options around what you know is popular and make those dishes just as appealing as the ones that you are either substituting or providing um, alternatives for. And really having those like mouthwatering descriptions of dishes will go a lot further than hoping people will choose based on environmental responsibility. For example, the World Resources Institute has been studying the language around menus and they found that focusing on, on the provenance, the flavor and the look and the feel of a dish can really boost sales over describing dishes as vegetarian or vegan meat free or healthy, low fat, or you know, something else that implies that there's some kind of health restriction to it. Um, they, one of the studies that they did was at the cafes in Sainsbury's um, uh, supermarkets in the UK. And the Sainsbury's has been selling for a long time a dish called the meat free sausage and mash. And when they renamed that dish to Cumberland spiced veggie sausages and mash, sales increased by more than 76% because it's really all about what people are getting and not what they're sacrificing. And the World Resources Institute as, as part of this, um, they call it their better buying lab. And part of this research that they've done, they also found that people were more likely to order the vegan or vegetarian dishes when they were part of the regular menu. So something that's just like, you know, a simple, you know, V or icon or something to indicate that it was vegetarian, but having those as part of, you know, kind of the, 
the regular rotation and the regular uh, presentation of other dishes was far more successful rather than separating them into their own section. And a lot of that has to do with um, you know, that people enjoy eating vegetarian and vegan foods, but they sometimes have negative connotations with identifying as vegetarian or vegan. So they want to eat these foods, but they they don't always want the identity that goes with it. So you want to make it as easy as possible for people to, um, you know, to choose the climate friendly dishes. So the second step on the roadmap is to look at, um, to look at your sourcing. And Reducing meat and dairy is the most impactful step that you can take. There were studies that looked at the, um, the climate impact of food miles and what would happen if you ate an entirely local diet. And it found that reducing, that eliminating meat and dairy just one day a week saved more greenhouse gas emissions than eating a full-time completely locally sourced diet. So there are a lot of benefits to local food. It supports your local economy and it you know, does have a, a climate benefit over, you know, kind of one to one in the same ingredients over foods that have to travel far. But the first step is, again, reducing that meat and dairy. But beyond that, it's important to look at from there where your food is coming from. So from there, I would look into programs where you can of how can you, you know, work with, um, with local farmers or local grower co-ops and, um, you know, and support the, the economy and the farmers in your community where you can. Uh, part of that is also buying seasonal produce and adapting your menu to, um, you know, to really feature those seasonal and regional uh, ingredients. Um, buy organic produce when you can. Um, the, you know, pesticides have actually a fairly significant impact on the climate, but they are also really decimating pollinator populations and harming other wildlife. And you know, we need the pollinators in particular to continue growing healthy food. So there are a lot of concerns around pesticide use. So if you're able to buy organic produce, then do so. And for the animal products that you do buy, um, look for organic meat from smaller operations in your area that really um, are dedicated to minimizing their impact on wildlife. Um, you know, make sure you look past whatever you know, whatever greenwashing phrasing that they might have and, you know, really talk to them about making sure that they have, you know, predator friendly practices, you know, that they, you know, avoid, um, you know, that they avoid harms to, to all wildlife and that they really try to promote um, native biodiversity uh, on their farms. And with seafood, um, you want to look for seafood uh, sources that minimize bycatch and that are really committed to sustainable fisheries. Um, so the third step is having a, uh, a commitment to the climate. And this, like I was talking about earlier, is really bringing together your food policy and your climate policy. Um, work with the other folks at your institution to really try to integrate your menus and your food purchasing into your cl institution's climate action plan. Because it's really, you know, again, that all hands on deck that the work that you are doing in food service and in cafeteria should be really aligned with what the rest of your institution is doing, as well as having their support behind um, creating the climate friendly menus. And then the next step is to, you know, be wary of greenwashing. Um, as Jennifer and I both mentioned, there are a lot of unsubstantiated claims that come with food from, you know, everybody labels everything natural, which means nothing. Um, we're increasingly seeing more labels of regenerative, which uh, isn't defined. It doesn't have any real standards or metrics. There's an idea behind it, but it's hard to tell whether the farms are actually um, really truly implementing those values or, or just using that term to greenwash an idea or, you know, or one practice. So really try to look beyond those labels and make a commitment to dishes that focus on low, low emission ingredients um, for your climate friendly menus. And then finally, we really want to eliminate waste on the supply chain. It's you know, really hard in food service, of course, to police whether people eat what they take or throw out. And nobody wants to you know, tell people that they, you know, that they can't have as much food as they want when you're in food service. But there's a lot that you can do from the supply side to minimize waste. And that includes things like tracking, you know, what's being eaten and what ingredients are being used and adjusting ordering as needed, um, you know, using whole ingredients. There are a lot of really creative recipes out there for, you know, making sure that you're using, 
all of the um, all of the fruits and vegetables that you buy. You know, things like you're getting carrots. Um, you know, making carrot top pesto. Like there are a lot of things like that that can that can help you use. Um, food in really creative ways to make sure that you're minimizing how much you're throwing out. And then also looking at the other ways that, um, that might be involved in, in your food service and particularly avoiding single use utensils and packaging and really looking at where you can cut down on your plastic use and shift as much as possible to, to um, reusable products. So, um, with that, uh, that is kind of our basic roadmap to this and a few ideas for you to get you started. I know there's so much more that we can talk about here and you know, we're really excited to hear from you. Um, I hope that you're feeling inspired to be part of Climate Solutions from this and we're happy to take questions after Nathan wraps things up. So thank you for joining us. Wow, um, that was awesome. Thank you guys, uh, Center for Biological Diversity for that amazing presentation. There's just so much in there. And one thing I love about these webinars is that as immersed as I always am in just this whole world, I always leave with uh, new information, new things to think about in terms of just kind of this big picture, how, how all of this ties together. I love how plant-based is kind of this intersection between you know, uh, the health of the planet, the health of individuals, and and how much power consumers have. But also, one thing I really want to um, touch on uh, before we move on to questions is just the role of you all, food service providers, um, whether you're, you know, um, purchasers, chefs, whether you're um, working on uh, out front or in the back, like, you all have so much power uh, and more than you probably realize to make a genuine environmental impact. Um, and, and I think that that is a really key takeaway from all of this and that, you know, the dishes that you decide to um, innovate or, or create or, um, or the ingredients you decide to purchase really uh, pave the way for a more sustainable, healthy future. Um, you know, for individuals, for the planet, for animals, um, you name it. And I, I always like to close with this because I'm like, do not discount the role that you all can play as uh, food service providers. Um, so I just think that that's uh, really, really important. And, um, and I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, one thing before we move to the Q&A, uh, that I also want to talk about because one thing I know for sure is that food service is a busy world to be in. You guys are always, you know, it's fast paced. You're always trying to uh, meet the breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert deadlines and, and the rush. And so making these changes to your menus, I totally understand. is probably quite challenging. Um, but as uh, Stephanie and Jennifer were saying, that's kind of where we'd like to come in, um, the Humane Society of the United States and the Forward Food Collaborative. Um, so, you know, we're here to make this easier for you. Uh, and we recently unrolled, uh, or I should say rolled out, our Forward Food Pledge, uh, which basically is something I'm really excited to share this with you um, because it's a really great way to kind of um, take, it's, it's a really good way for us to be able to help you to make this, um, these menu transitions smooth and um, and enjoyable. I mean, uh, so let me break down the Forward Food Pledge really quickly. But basically, what it is, is um, a way that we're able to offer up all of our resources, which are all free. Um, so signing the Forward Food Pledge basically just commits you to making a certain percentage of um, plant-based menu changes per year. Um, in signing that pledge, what you get from us uh, are a whole bunch of awesome resources, including you know, um, a greenhouse gas assessment that is done by um, Dr. Isaac Emery, who is our staff environmental scientist. It's a, a really, really amazing report that he's able to put together to help identify, you know, the, the simplest changes you can make in your purchasing to have the greatest environmental impact. Um, you gain access to menu evaluations, ongoing consultation from our team, um, hands-on, in-person or virtual trainings that are chef-led, um, marketing materials, um, including uh, press releases, which are just a really good way to showcase, obviously, what, what you all are doing. Um, you know, all of these topics, human, public health, environmental 
health are such major talking points now that you know signing on to this pledge and, and making these menu changes we want to make sure you're getting the credit you deserve as being leaders and and really making these changes to help make the world a better place um you get a feature on our website and uh, and there's a lot more where that came from um so keep your eyes peeled we'll be uh we'll be sending that pledge around also one thing i want to say before the q a is um we're also all available offline to answer questions uh, if anybody has any as well. So I'm going to put our contact information up uh, in just a minute. Um, and uh, and so if you have questions, feel free to, um, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to input those there. Um, and I'm actually going to blow straight through my Q&A slide there. We're still going to do it, but I'm going to have our contact info up so you all can write it down. and. Um, one last plug for social media, follow us, um, tag us in, in, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're talking about this webinar, menu changes, events, um, hashtag forward food. We love it. We love seeing what you're doing. Um, and then keep an eye out for that survey um, that we're going to send out. So with that, I am going to um, let Amanda kind of field the Q&A and uh, Stephanie and Jennifer and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, time for some Q&A. So like Nathan said, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So just throw your questions there and we will get to them as they come. So let's start with an easy one. Will they be given a link to the recording? Yes, um, I believe we will be sending out a follow-up email um tomorrow and uh the link to the recording should be on there so you will be getting that and feel free to distribute it it'll also be available on our website um but we'll make sure we get that to all of you so good question thank you all righty so next up we have a question that asks are there efforts being made to work with producers of items like beyond beef to make them more readily available? I can go ahead and answer that. And Amanda, you're welcome to, to touch on it as well, because I know you work with um, a lot of the providers. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, all these companies, a lot of them are, are pretty pretty new. Um, some of them are older, uh, like Tofurky, you know, their supply chain is really, really good um, because they've been around a while. And yeah, they're always making efforts to make these items more accessible, um, to bring bring prices down, uh, you know, there's different sectors. There's um, there's like the grocery, there's the the restaurant sector, and you know, different companies I believe have different pathways that they're taking. The short answer is absolutely yes. All these companies want to make these items easier to get into your hands or onto your plates. Um, so it's it's only going to get better. Awesome. Thanks. Let's see, we've got another question here and it says, do you have recipes that meet the school lunch guidelines for meat and meat alternatives? Another great question. And the answer is yes. Um, so like I was saying, uh, towards the beginning of the webinar, our team here, uh, we have uh, dietitians, we have food service professionals, we have chefs, um, and many of whom have worked in the K-12 environment. So all of our K-12 recipes, which are um, available open source on our website, forwardfood.org. They're broken down by um, K-12s, healthcare, or college and universities. All of those um, K-12 recipes are already aligned with uh, the National School Lunch Program um, and ready to go. So it's, it's all there. It's all there. And we're also happy to, um, you know, pick out some recipes if you ever want. If you have specific ingredients you love using, um, we're always help you, happy to help out with that as well. So. They're ready to go. Awesome. Okay, next question. Are there suggestions or information available to help locations find more local or regional farming co-ops to help with getting more local products? I can answer that. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in, but 
you know, whether you're working with a school or a hospital um, or a city, they're going to have a sustainability office that will have a lot of that information. But a lot of cities also have food policy councils, and they're sort of coordinating regional farming, regional food hubs, and so on. And they'll have a lot of information about co-ops and opportunities for um, supporting local sourcing. I think one thing that I would add to that, and food policy councils are a great resource, but also, um, you know, check out your local farmers market as well, because a lot of the um, the producers who sell at farmers markets, that's just a small piece of what they do, and they're also selling to restaurants and institutions, and will be aware of any um, co-ops and who else they work with that might be able to um, support the volume that you need. So, and that's also a great way to start building relationships directly with the local producers. So, you know, if you're able to, I think, you know, checking out your local farmer's market and having those conversations is, is also a great way to, to start to find people. Great, thank you both. Um, so thinking back to the part of the conversation where you were explaining how at a, um, you know, a, a coffee place, you could take away the default of serving milk and instead having folks choose which milk they would like, how do you see that working in an all you care to eat location, something similar? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, um, so if it's something where like the food is just out and available for folks, then I think giving it kind of equal real estate, uh, making sure that the alternatives are featured kind of just as prominently and have, um, you know, just as much of, of an appeal to them as, you know, as the, the animal based options, um, you know, and if it's a place where people have to come up and give somebody their order, that it's just kind of like a, a build your own sort of thing, right, where it's like it's instead of assuming that dairy goes into something or, you know, if they're building, um, you know, a salad or, you know, or a grain bowl or something like that, that, that it's like they have to choose that protein along with choosing whatever the other options are that they want in the item. All right, thank you. All right, folks, keep those questions coming. We've still got a couple more minutes for Q&A for you. But I do have another question. Um, you know, we talked a lot today about how, you know, beef itself is, is very harmful to the planet. And, you know, we tend to find that sometimes people will navigate from beef to something like chicken. Um, what would you say, uh, you know, in, in response to that, would that be a good switch? Or, you know, why would someone maybe consider instead switching to something that's completely plant-based instead. Do you want to take that, Jennifer? I'm sure if I understand correctly, yeah, it's really important that we're making a shift away from a beef to plant-based food. So the metrics that we're studying to meet our climate mitigation targets, for example, as well as land use and water pollution and so forth, are really switching from beef to plant-based foods. Um, there has been a reduction in beef consumption and an increase in chicken. And I think that people are um, sort of associating chicken with something healthier for their hearts and that must be better for the planet. And that's not necessarily true. Chicken comes with enormous cost as well, um, nitrogen, manure pollution and so forth. So to really strengthen the menu, it's important to double increase the plant-based options. And when you're swapping out things, you know, beef burrito, for example, moves towards a bean burrito. Um, rather than a chicken one or so on. And chicken is the most common, um, but you know, there's fish and pork as well. And just moving away from animal agriculture is gonna give the climate impact that you're looking for, for that stamp of sort of um, climate friendly menus. And I'll just add on to that, if that's all right. Um, I wanna make another plug for the greenhouse gas assessment that we offer because it's a really cool way. It, it breaks it down by category and you see that, I mean, yes, um, like chicken may have a, a lower impact than beef, but then the drop from chicken uh, to plant-based ingredients is gigantic. I can't emphasize that enough. Not to mention the cost savings. And I know that is always a factor that um, that any institution is uh, motivated by because you know that's that's how that's how the world works. 
Um, and so I, I really want to hammer that in. Um, that greenhouse gas assessment is a really, really cool way to be able to, you know, evaluate um, your, your purchasing so that um, you can really see the impact that um, going plant-based has. We also have some um, really cool graphics um, that show the, the cost savings um, by weight or by serving um, on different dishes. Um, whether it's burritos or pizza or, or really whatever um, shows how much you're actually saving um, by making those completely plant-based. Uh, so anyway, that's just another plug for that greenhouse gas assessment for the Forward Food Pledge because um, you'll you'll really notice that impact. It's pretty incredible. So great, thank you, Bill. All right, we've got a question here that asks, do you have products at Cisco? I have to stay compliant with purchasing. Um, so I'm gonna just switch that a little bit and uh, change it just to say, are there plant-based products available through Cisco? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, those supply chains are always being uh, expanded uh, and there's definitely, I, I don't know off the top of my head which products are um, offered through Cisco. We could definitely find out that information. Um, please feel free to email me. Uh, but there are, are definitely products that are available through Cisco, um, ready to go. So you can definitely get your hands on those. And I love that you want to. Nathan, I feel like that might be a good plug for our upcoming event in October the product training, if you want to explain a little bit more about that too. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Uh, yeah, so we do, um, I think that they are uh, biannual product trainings, um, which are incredible, and you can uh, register for that on our website. Um, and what they are, are basically, we work with suppliers, they will send product samples from a few, like, um, you know, three, four, maybe five different companies to your institutions. Um, there, it's usually a week long event where, you know, we kind of break down the products for you and talk about, you know, what, what uh, they're made of and how to use them a little bit. Then you get to during the week, have a fun time innovating with those. Um, uh, you can actually go on our website. We have some of the recipes that were created from past events up there and ready to go. Um, but you get to try out these products. You get free samples of them. Uh, and, and you get to really kind of get an idea of, um, what are their properties and, and how can you use them? You get to make new dishes that have never been made before. I mean, it's really, really cool. And going back to what I was saying about, you know, food service professionals being trailblazers, that's a really good example of how you get to suddenly make a plant-based dish that hasn't been invented yet. I mean, that's so cool. So yeah, keep your eye out for that. It is in coming up in October. Registration is open and we would love to have you at that event. It's a lot of fun and we get um, great feedback from all the participants. Everyone has a great time. So thanks, Amanda. Yeah, thank you. All righty, another question here. Uh, what percentage of the ingredients in the plant-based meat replacements are grown domestically? How does the number of miles traveled to get to your plate differ from animal protein? Um, so that's a great question and it's going to vary, you know, obviously based on product. I can't tell you like every, you know, the percentage for every single plant-based product out there, but I believe that most of the top ones now, you know, especially if we're looking at, you know, all the attention that's on like Beyond and Impossible, that the majority, if not all the ingredients are sourced domestically. Um, so I think that, you know, that's, that is definitely, you know, a factor is to think about that piece. But, you know, again, if we go back to that chart, the greenhouse gas emission savings based on what the actual ingredients in there are, are, you know, enormous, even if they are shipped further, you, they are using far less greenhouse gas emissions to produce those plant-based meats compared to what it is to produce beef. Um, and of course, when you're looking at where, you know, beef or, or other meats are produced, whether or not there's even any or enough available locally is, um, is going to vary a lot depending on, on where you live. So, um, as well as, you know, if you are going through a, you know, kind of a, a central provider, like somebody like Cisco, there's, you know, that can also be coming from long distances. So, you know, again, that food miles piece, it's, 
it's part of the picture and it's a consideration, but looking at the bigger picture of like, what are the overall impacts? Um, even if you're comparing local beef to um, plant-based meat that is sourced and produced, you know, on the other side of the country from you, that plant-based meat is still going to win out when it comes to environmental benefits. And um, I just wanna add on one last thing that's kind of more of a, a long-term, um, a long-term aspect of all that, but a huge amount of um, you know plant-based matter grown uh, in the United States goes to uh, feeding um, animals for for meat. As you know, that plant-based um, uh, movement continues to grow. Ingredients are going to continue to to be more uh, widely accessible as well, and so. Uh, in theory, at least, you know, kind of that environmental cost of transporting uh, will go down because less, um, you know, less um, corn, soy, all those things will be going to feeding um, cattle and will be going into awesome products or whole food uh, recipes. So anyway, just kind of a, another spin off of that, but um, it, the, that, that impact will definitely continue to drop. So. I'm just going to add one more thing to that. I would encourage you again, and this is where like you have a lot of power in your voice as food service providers, because not only with the folks like who you are feeding, but also with the supply chains that you're working with. And I would encourage you that if there is a plant-based product that you really want to use and you have questions or concerns about things like where their ingredients are coming from, or, you know, whether they are, you know, planning on integrating more organic ingredients into their products and things like that, I would recommend reaching out and contacting them because it's great for them to hear from people like you, because even though plant-based meats are so much better than the animal-based products, we're always encouraging them like that, you know, not to rest on those laurels, right? Not to just be better than animal meat, but to really push themselves to be the best that they can be within their sector from an environmental standpoint. So if there are questions that you have, like, you know, let them know and let them know that these are concerns that their clients and potential clients have. Great, thank you both. Um, another question here, can you please share a sign up link to the October product training in your follow-up email to this webinar? Absolutely, yeah, um, make sure to put that we're going to send one follow up um, tomorrow and then I'm going to also I'll be in touch as well next week. And so we will definitely include that. We'll make it nice and easy to sign up. I love the interest and we can't wait to see you there. Awesome. And then we do have one. It's more of a comment rather than a question, I believe, um, just about an idea that they say, I think we as operators with the push that your organizations can provide to work with group purchasing organizations to help drive a lot of these proposals. They're often focused on cost savings, but maybe they could look at making the things you talk about a focus to operators or at least an option where it can fit. So just a good idea. I don't know if either of you would like to respond to that idea. Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. I think that, you know, there are a lot of resources um, that you all have um, that, you know, I think are, are useful as it is with things like group purchasing. Um, and that can definitely be used in this climate friendly menu context. And, you know, and again, you know, pushing, you know, those groups and your larger suppliers and individual suppliers who you work with, you know, again, just using your voice is you can help really change the whole sector even beyond your, your institution. Great, thank you. Well, it looks like that's all of the questions we have and we've got like one minute left. So all of you all can, you know, close us out and, and leave us with a couple of, you know, where should we go next? What would, what should we look to do? So I'll hand it back over to all of you. Yeah, um, I'm just really gonna quickly thank uh, Center for Biological Diversity again um, and thank all of you for joining us today um, for all the awesome questions. Please do not hesitate to reach out um, offline. We are here to answer questions. We're here to, to assist you in any way possible. Um, so yeah, we, you got our emails there. 
and, uh, and we're pretty easy to find. So thank you all for joining us. And um, Jennifer and Stephanie, if you have anything else you want to add, um, but I just can't thank you all enough. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to reiterate that I'm happy to answer any questions for resources. You know, I do outreach with schools and other institutions and events and catering and I wrote that guide. So um, if there's any way I can help, I'm very happy to answer questions. Yeah, and thank you again to the Humane Society for having us and for all of you for joining us today and, and for your interest in, in climate friendly menus. So thanks so much, everyone. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to stop the share. Um, we will see you all hopefully in person soon, hopefully at that product training. Um, reach out. We're here. We love to answer questions and help. Take care, everybody.